Welcome to the Wiser Wealth Management Roundtable, where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict-free. I'm your host, Casey Smith, guiding you to financial freedom are my co-hosts, Brad Lyons and Matthews Barnett. Hey, guys. Hi, Casey. How's it going? So this has been a, uh, a fun series. Um, we've done uh, the last few podcasts on five steps to financial success and retirement. Let's go through and kind of summarize this and talk a little bit about uh, the next series. That's a great idea. You know, the, the PDF that we've put out there that was produced by Matthews Barnett, CFP here, really goes through in great detail the things that need to be, you know, set up and, and looked at for your retirement in order to make sure that you're going to be on track. It's a great resource. You can find it at www.wiserinvestor.com. You can download it from there. But the five steps are, of course, managing your cash flow. We want to build and maintain a cash reserve in retirement. We want to maintain investing discipline. We're going to talk a little bit more about these in detail and summarize it once again. We're going to avoid carrying debt into retirement. That's so important. It's something that we believe so heartily in. And then we're going to try and maximize Social Security, try to get the most that we can out of that, if that means to defer it for as long as possible or to take it when, when needed. Um, where we're going to do the best to maximize that payment to our clients. Retirement is so much about cash flow. When you really think about it, people are very comfortable, especially in today's society, in carrying payments, making those payments. But when you have uh, a sudden reduction or a uh, stoppage in, in work, not, not because of um, not because you weren't planned for it, but you know, you're retired. You just you don't have that paycheck anymore, and so the less money that goes out in payments, that's great. You know, I, I was talking to a client. I think it was yesterday. He said, um, "I don't mind taking money and going on a forty thousand dollar vacation, but I do mind paying eighteen hundred dollars a month for a Range Rover, right? I, I don't want to. I, d- I don't want this big monthly payments. So I, I want to be able to not have any money going out if, if I don't have to. Essentially, when we pay off debt, it's almost like getting a tax-free raise because you're increasing your disposable income at that point in time and making sure that you know we limit our debts and eliminate our debts even uh, in retirement just means that we have more disposable income for ourselves to utilize for our living expenses. You know, one of the interesting things about retirement, in, in case you mentioned, you know, the paycheck during our working years. In our working years, our income tends to be single source, our, our jobs, our paychecks. In retirement, the income is cobbled together from multiple sources. And that's where a good financial advisor can help understand where to take income from in order to maximize your portfolio's uh, potential for, for income. So we want to maximize the Social Security. We want to maximize your pension payments. We want to maximize your tax efficiency of withdrawals from either taxable or non-taxable accounts. So I'd probably use the word optimize, optimize? when it comes Great. to those because yeah. you know you can maximize a pension payment, but then if you pass away, your spouse may not get anything. So I'd probably say, what's the best way to optimize Social Security? Is it taking it sooner? Is it taking it later? Uh, optimizing your your pension options, uh, and then more importantly, optimizing do you pull out of your brokerage account, your Roth account, or your IRA? So right now, we have a choice. I mean, the future, the government may not give us choices. <laughs> but, <laughs> but right now, we have a choice in how we pull that out and what's the best tax strategy uh, to, to, to come up with that. And it's not always... Uh, plain and simple. In fact, you know, we we can't even do this math just by looking at it anymore. It's gotten so complicated that that Matthews is running tax simulations through software we have just for that. It doesn't prepare taxes; it just analyzes taxes. Rules are always changing, so yeah, you, it, it's helpful to have the, that to uh, help you out there. I think something we haven't covered as we go into this too is not only not having a paycheck in retirement and the difference on living off what you've saved and optimizing other sources is psychologically retirement's a little different. You've gotten so used to the behaviors of saving and living off a paycheck that when you no longer have that job and daily routine, uh, as well as those uh, funds coming in and living off uh, other sources, it's significantly a little different for you. You know, another thing that um, uh, that we we should talk about too is is building and maintaining cash reserves. So if if you think about how much cash you need to have for retirement, it's a little bit different than in your working years. For example, you know, in your working years, you're thinking if there's a sudden job loss um, or a catastrophic event in my house I have to have to pay for, you're thinking that three to six months income replacement. But in retirement, it's not really income replacement because you, you have these streams of income that are kind of set uh, to come in. So it's really more of portfolio protection. It's a buffer between you and these volatile stock markets at times. It's a buffer between you uh, and having to go into the principal 
of your investments, uh, which, you know, I always use the analogy for digging ditches. And we have a certain amount of time we have to dig these ditch in. If you give two people a break, <laughs> you're not going to get there as fast, right? Or if you t remove two people and send them home, you're not going get, to get it done as fast. So obviously, we all want as many people digging a ditch as possible. But for a lot of people, you know, we, we have a limited uh, resources. And so if you pull 25% or even 10% of those resources too soon, uh, you're not going to make it to, to age 95 or 100, whatever the goal is. And the reason we discussed is that we're using two, two years is even if it's a big, uh, you know, a recession type pullback, you know, it usually recovers in at least a, a year and a half, two years. So what we're trying to do is really bridge that gap to uh, get their portfolio back to where it was previously before those withdrawals. Yeah, because even in retirement, life happens. Opportunities come up and emergencies come up. Either one of those you have to be prepared for. And if they come up at the most inopportune time relative to your portfolio, you're in, it's ending costing you more than you had hoped it would have given that you may have to liquidate certain securities at at a time when they're, the prices and values are depressed. Yep. And that's what that's what uh, Brad does for us here at Wiser is well, one of the many things uh, is maintaining that that two year cash bucket for our clients inside the portfolios. And it's hard. It's hard to do that because you have money in cash that creates a drag on the overall portfolio performance. So he's constantly trying to find ways of getting low risk, um, higher yield uh, investments inside the portfolio to, to help that cash try to keep up with inflation. It's a decision that you make once a quarter. Do I uh, pull from my cash reserves for my income for this quarter or do I take my gains from investments and refill my cash bucket? Uh, and it's done every three months um, and it works well. So far, it's been great. This is uh, one of my favorite topics. Number three in our list is maintaining investment discipline. Uh, you know, <laughs> our behavior is typically what derails us. Um, investing really isn't that complicated, but, but we, we get all fixated on you know, news cycles. So news sells fear, and fear very often uh, makes people react. Because if the house is on fire, you get a hose and you put it out, right? Sometimes the best thing to do in portfolio management is absolutely nothing. Right? Don't argue with an irrational person. If the person's irrational, you just walk away because you're never going to win the argument because they're, they're so disconnected from reality. Right, It's the same way with portfolio management. Sometimes the markets get so upside down. The best thing to do is, is turn off the TV and, and enjoy your life because, hey, you got two years of cash, right? You can turn this thing off for two years and walk away. That's, that's one of the reasons why we do that. Well, doing nothing, as, as you said, is a decision. It is. It, quite frankly, it's, it's do something or do nothing. Both are decisions that are made by the portfolio manager. So, so when we say do nothing, it doesn't mean that we're not reviewing, we're not analyzing, we're not taking a look at markets, etc. It means that we've done all that and decided to do nothing. You mentioned emotion in the markets, but behavior emotion as well. You know, you usually don't make your best decisions when you're emotional. Uh, that's why it is, like you said, a good time to step back and, and think long term and not let these short term blips and uh, the noise on the media really affect your emotions and your behaviors. One of my favorite things, it's not my favorite at the time, but just stories looking back at like financial crises or, or the, the market falling is people calling up and saying, hey, um, I'll tell you what, this is, this is really bad. This COVID or this Lehman Brothers collapse or this 9-11, this is really bad. Let's just go to cash. And, you know, I don't immediately go to this, but – but usually somewhere in the conversation ends up being something like, okay, let's say we go to cash. Well, when do we put it back in? And the answer is, well, I don't know. That's what I pay you for. And I said, I'm not a stock day trader. I don't, <laughs> I, don't I don't know <laughs> yeah. what's up or what's down. Our on, crystal on any... ball gets a little fuzzy when we look out <laughs> over the future. I know that I, I can tell you exactly what to do to be 99.9% .9 successful over your lifetime. Uh, I can't really tell you what to do in today's market and if we should be in or out. Well, you'll uh, hear when inside. it goes up, too. And then at what point <laughs> is up far enough to get back in? And, yeah. and when you got back in, have you, have you missed that, that opportunity? So, well, it's interesting when, when people say this, and we hear it you know, frequently enough that this is a, a real topic of, 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 of consideration here, is that what they're also saying is I, my portfolio, as it's currently constructed, is for X amount of time period. 
It's for the next month. It's for the next, you know, until next until the next event happens where the market goes down or the next next emergency. When we're building portfolios, we're matching them to a time frame out to age 95 in retirement. Yeah, it doesn't mean that we don't make tweaks and do rebalances, but the, the construction of the portfolio needs to match the time frame of the investor. When people call and they say, go to cash, it means that their portfolio was only constructed to last until the next emergency comes up. Our portfolios look beyond these normal events that occur from time to time in the marketplace, and the long-term capital market assumptions are already built in that include these events that do occur. Really what people are saying is, I need a portfolio that, that matches my time frame. Uh, my portfolio currently just is good for the next market uh, until the next hot stock comes along. If you invested a thousand dollars from 2010 to 2020, you would have gained, turned that thousand dollars into $2,897. So let's call it $2,900. If you uh, missed the 10 best days of the market. And a lot of times, if you remember, the 10 best days or, or the best day of the stock market comes after the worst day of the stock market. So you hit the eject button on the, on the worst day, but you missed the 10 best days, you would have lost 33% of that return. You would, you would have only gained uh, $945, basically. Uh, or I'm sorry, you would have been worth $1,945. Right, which is a gain of 945 yeah. So, yes. If you missed the 20 best days, you're down to 1500 If you missed the 40 best days, you're down to $923. You actually lost money. So 1500 missing the best uh, the 20 days is a 50% reduction. That's pretty huge. And yeah. like you said, that could happen those immediately following 20 days. By the time you've actually analyzed it and decided to get back in, you, you've missed that whole return. It's, it's all about the emotional feel because we don't like losing and we see something that's, that's, that's going down and we, we immediately go, I, I can't take this anymore. So that's part of why you build portfolios initially. That's why we use, use bonds. I mean, even today people go, why, why do we have bonds in our portfolios? Everyone, everyone tells us that bonds are bad. It, that's not entirely true, but the main reason why you have bonds right now is it's insurance. I mean, I don't even care what it yields. I just need it to be short-term bonds to, to offset the volatility in the stock market. Yesterday, the day that we we're recording this, yesterday there was some news in China that uh, disrupted the market. We were down 600-something points on the Dow. I looked at my phone. I have all of, my, all of our holdings. It's all red. It's all red. I get down to halfway, and then it starts. A sea of green comes up. It's all the bonds. It's all the bonds in the portfolio that every, the world runs to for safety, when when things don't look right yeah the bonds in the portfolio right now and people are correct when they say that we're not getting any return because we're accustomed to the past where you're getting five six percent return on, on a bond portfolio well, well those days don't exist you have to live in the world as it exists today when doing portfolio construction so right now we've constructed portfolios with investment grade bonds in order to mitigate the risks and the volatility of the stock and the equity side of the portfolio where we get gains over long periods of time. So they are doing something in the portfolio. It's just not what they had been doing in the past where they had provided that extra income component as well. Absolutely. Point four for being uh, successful in retirement is avoid carrying debt. You know, we, we manage a lot of money for a lot of families. We're a wealth management firm. That's what people expect us to do. But we have a whole segment of our business that we operate uh, on an hourly basis. We bill, basically we turn the hourly rate into like a flat fee rate. And I tell you what, this brings me a lot of joy. Because if you think about the amount of debt that we've eliminated as a firm with clients' accounts, uh, maybe not people who are managing assets for it, but people who are coming in, they're 20, 30, even in their 40s, and they go, I'm kind of stuck. I have a good income, but I'm stuck with all these payments. And we're able to use our uh, debt elimination spreadsheet. You probably use that every week, right, for somebody? Frequently, like. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we we're able to show them this is the path out. This is this is how you can have a better life. And it's so it, it's so frustrating to see people that are are making a bunch of minimum payments, and that's all they can make. Uh, and Dave Ramsey is the king of this. I don't want to steal, steal any of his thunder. He's probably eliminated billions of dollars in debt uh, just for people in the Southeast. Um, I think he's syndicated other places too, but mostly in the South. And we've kind of followed that lead. 
and said, okay, we're going to be a wealth management firm that is, is helping people become, find financial success, even those that other firms would turn away. And, and, and it's, it brings a lot of joy to see 18 months later, sometimes less than that, sometimes instantly. Sometimes we can just move assets around and convince people this is a great idea. <laughs> Let's get rid of these, these, these debts. And then you see them come back in and the, and the relief that they have that they don't have to deal with that anymore. And then they start saving and they're saving thousands of dollars every single month uh, for their future. And it's, it's, a, it's a mindset. It um, goes against the grain in our industry. Uh, one, most firms wouldn't even talk to the people. Two, even for our wealthy clients, a lot of them are carrying mortgages. And mortgages are really cheap right now. But we're very um, adamant that your primary home always be paid off. Secondary homes, different story. But it, it's amazing how many emails we got during the COVID crash in 2020 of like, I'm so glad you convinced me to pay off my house because I don't have any anxiety right now. I know that this portfolio could go to zero and I'd probably still be okay. And, and no one ever wants that, obviously. And for a portfolio here to go to zero, 6,700 companies have to go out of business and 12,000 bonds have to default. So <laughs> that's a whole different podcast. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, well, the doom, I hope we don't that's, have to have. That's the doomsday or uh, uh, prepping podca- podcast. Yeah, yeah. But the, I, the whole concept here is live your life. Don't live someone else's life or what you think someone else's life is. You'd be amazed how many people have really nice things, but they have large homes that are empty. They don't have furniture in them. They have really nice cars, but they drive home to a house worth probably the same price as the car. It's kind of upside down when you think about it. And in Metro Atlanta, I feel like it's really bad. I feel like it's really bad. Atlanta's a, a flashy area. We say it all the time. It's, you know, stop making other people wealthy and, and start building wealth your own way. So uh, a lot of those people don't, they may have high incomes like we mentioned before, but they don't, they've got a lot of debt that they're carrying to, to have oh, those yeah. cars in those homes. Yeah, they're rich. Yeah. They're rich people. I tried to explain. I know my... you're using that word specifically, <laughs> am, and you're right. avoiding the I, other word. I am know? because because uh, I, I tell my kids, and I explain it to younger people all the time. I said, "Well, that's a rich family. They have good income and they have really nice things, but wealth is actually hidden. You don't see wealth. Wealth is hidden. That, those are the people who probably drive up in the Honda and are doing other loans out there that are bringing in five to eight percent for them, or they're making." Uh, themselves wealthy not making other you know other yeah. people wealthy. a millionaire next door yeah absolutely, absolutely. And, and and that's really one of the wonderful things as you mentioned casey about helping people eliminate debt it, it relieves them of that debt payment that debtor payment that is made every single month and once that happens our clients begin they, they feel that lift off their shoulders and then the next nuts the very next month they take that same payment for, for example and put it into their account and they see the value go up. Right. And they begin to see that they're working towards creating wealth for themselves rather than creating, as, as Matthew said, wealth for somebody else. And that's such a wonderful event in someone's life. When, when, and to know that we've helped them do that is very exciting. What's interesting is you have some people that come in that will say, yeah, but the interest rates are really low and I can have this money invested in the market. And, and essentially... You, you say, would, would if your home is already paid off, would you take out a mortgage and invest in stocks? Well, no. Well, that's essentially what you're doing because you have the ability to pay the home off. So why would you invest in the stock market and borrow or leverage your home? You, that, right? And right. they're usually not actually investing the additional funds that they would be doing. It's just sitting in a checking account earning half a percent. <laughs> while right. that, that so-called low interest rate of maybe 2 2.5%, they're still losing 2% with uh, their, is, ch- their savings account. That is very true. U- usually the money's sitting in the savings account at 0.2, uh, right. and we say just pay off the house. And, and I will say that there's um, probably some exceptions to that. Um, you know, if you're worth $60 million and, and you decide to leverage up for some reason— uh, maybe it's for a tax strategy, not for the mortgage interest, but but you're investing in something that generates uh, some tax savings, something of that nature. It, it, there's always exceptions to that. We have clients who have mortgages at, that are ultra high net worth, but um, I'd, I'd say that uh, that's not general generally good advice. Uh, I always like to see that primary home that is uh, uh, that's always paid off. So I think we've harped on avoiding uh, carrying debt. Next one is optimizing, or we have it here, is maximizing Social Security. The whole point here is 
I'm not sure where it comes from other than just kind of lack of education. But the whole point here is that we want we want to um, make sure that you're getting the best from Social Security and you're not using fear of Social Security being bankrupt, uh, fear of not getting yours, <laughs> a lot of different things. We have a great podcast on this that I would encourage you guys to go back and, and listen to. My take, generally speaking, talking to the thousand people that download the podcast is you delay Social Security till age 70. That's a default. And if it's going to be sooner than that, there has to be a good reason. It has to be health. Uh, it could be financial because you can't work anymore and you're only like 63, 62. That, that's a different story, right? But the default is you wait till 70. The reason why is you're getting a bonus every single year that you wait. You're getting an 8% increase from either 66 or 67, depending what your retirement age is, all the way until age 70, plus you're getting the inflation on top of that. Which is most likely going to be greater than you're going to get return on the assets that you're going to utilize in order to produce that income for yourself until you begin taking Social Security. Right. So the return is upside down, as you're saying, in the favor of Social Security, of deferring it to age 70 with those 8% increases plus inflation. And this is a big deal for a lot of Americans. I don't think people realize there's a lot of information out there, but there's a lot of misinformation as well. But about a third of retirees rely fully on Social Security, uh, which is a pretty huge number. Uh, and actually about 50% rely for 50% of their income on Social Security. So uh, Americans really need Social Security. So it's also important, like we said, to optimize it and not just claim early at 62, just because you've, you've paid into it or, or the fear of that it won't be there later on in life. And for the most part, you know, the, the Social Security program has been one of the most successful government programs that's ever existed. I really don't think that it's going to go away. There's been talk relative to whether or not the trust fund, some of those uh, uh, values have, have are going to last, you know, for in perpetuity. But there will be fixes that come along. There are people that are going to come along that we just don't know about yet. We're going to be able to fix this. We're going to be able to come together. I'm, I'm completely convinced on this. Well, it's 75% solved. Everyone thinks that Social Security goes to zero, and it doesn't because there's people who are working right now paying into the system, which right. covers 75% of the liabilities. So every time new people come into the job market, right, they're paying into the they're system. They're paying into the system. Right. So low unemployment would help. That'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, low unemployment helps it. Uh, and the reality is that it can be solved. I think right now, though, it gets solved simply through um, increased taxes. And I don't think in, there's any politician. Well, the current administration doesn't have any problem raising taxes right now. But the point being that I don't think any politician wants to raise the um, uh, what we have to pay in Social Security right now. But as it gets closer to 2033, then all of a sudden they're saving Social Security. Right. It's, it's all political. Definitely a big political piece here. <laughs> it could have been solved already, but like oh, you said, absolutely. nobody really wants to touch well, it unless they're the, the one solving the problem. It could have been solved by not borrowing from the fund to begin with, but that's neither here nor there. That's too late. That, that horse has already left the barn. Right, exactly. But, but we've looked at other options. I mean, younger clients, you could push full retirement past 67. And the, the big one would be, we've mentioned this in our last podcast in our blog, was just stopping the you know the cap on the max on Social Security, and, and that alone would, would pretty much solve that problem. So there, there's a lot of options out there, so I don't we don't see this being an issue, but there, there's a lot of noise. It's probably the, the biggest topic that we hear about with people that want to claim for Social Security. There's kind of a theme in, in the five steps that I've just, it's just all coming to my head, actually. I should have thought of this at the beginning. But you think from a, an advisory standpoint that there are so many advisors out there that are very self-serving in that their whole purpose is to meet whatever sales goals their company has set for them. So they want to sell that whole life. They want to sell that annuity. Those are the biggest uh, paydays for them. And then they want to sell uh, portfolios that are typically built with funds that are good for the company, good for the advisor. Doesn't mean, mean it's bad for the client necessarily, but not necessarily the best for the client either. They don't have to seek out the best funds. When it comes down to good advisors, there's really three things. One is delaying Social Security because Anytime you delay Social Security, that means you have to spend down some of your own, your own assets in order to get there, right? So you have to do the math on that to make sure spending down to then not spend your assets later works out. 
So there's a break-even age. We we have calculators that help help us do that. Delaying Social Security is always a sign of a good advisor. The second sign of a good advisor is being charitable because charity takes away typically from investment assets. And so if you take away from investment assets and you take away, you know, you spend down your own assets, that's less billing that that firm can do on managing your money, right? And then the other one is paying off debt. I've talked to so many advisors say, why do you tell your clients to to pay off their homes? I mean, you can make more money in the stock market. And it's like, oh, but it's not, it's not all about money. It's about health of the client as well. If we can live a uh, anxiety free or, or more healthy life going forward, we're going to live longer and then we're going to live happy, right? That's the whole concept. Those are th- really three things that are signs of a good ad- financial advisor, in, in my opinion, because those are all three things that take money from the firm that's giving the recommendations, right? If that makes sense. Well, in the end, we're trying to maximize our clients' wealth. Yeah, absolutely. Right? You know, because if you take money from your portfolio or your account and pay off your mortgage, your wealth remains the same for the client. Yes, yeah. it's net net. Now, who gets paid on those assets, as you're referring to, it may be may differ. Okay, but we're talking about the health and wealth of the client here. Absolutely. Talking about health and wealth of the client. Good segue, Brad. I am very excited about our next theme coming up for this quarter. Uh, so starting uh, on October, going all the way through uh, our December podcast. This is our, is it our favorite time of the season? I don't know that it is. <laughs> But it's, it's time to start thinking about taxes and things that you can do to reduce your tax bill, uh, tax planning. In October, there's, there's actually deadlines for creating 401k plans and, and uh, other types of small business retirement plans. But we have a guest coming in, Jordan uh, Sudi from Sudi CPA. She's uh, related to uh, Michael Sudi, who's the owner of that firm. And Jordan will be coming in as a guest Uh, host with us for um, the entire quarter, uh, this last quarter of the year. And we have some great topics planned. We have uh, guests coming in with her as well (laughs) for some of the podcasts. So we'll be kind of in and out whether which three of us are are a part of that, but sometimes there'll be four of us and sometimes there'll be two of us. But I'm really excited about the podcast series and we are uh, probably have put more work into this series than we've ever had in our podcasts. Because we're financial advisors, we're not tax preparers. So therefore, for us, we have to go that additional step to understand something that we don't always advise on on a daily basis. And so I think Jordan coming to the podcast is going to be um, a great benefit to have a CPA here. It is. You know, you, you mentioned the word tax planning. It's awfully difficult to plan after the year is over. So. <laughs> yes. I feel like, I feel like, yeah, it's true. I feel like people talk about tax, but they talk about it in February yeah. and it's too it's late. late. There's only like one thing you can do as a business, business owner to, to change anything from the past, which would be profit sharing. But right. So we encourage all the listeners out there to, to tune into our tax planning series uh, coming up here in the near future. And we look forward to seeing from you all. All right, guys. Good talk. And uh, let's go running full steam into taxes. Sounds great. Enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to the Wiser Roundtable podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss out on new episodes. Head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out if you have any questions. We would love to hear from you. Today's episode was produced and edited by Lilton Moore. Wiser Wealth Management Incorporated is a registered investment advisor. Information presented is for educational purposes only and does not intend to make an offer or solicitation for the sale or purchase of any specific securities, investments, or investment strategies. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Be sure to first consult with a qualified financial advisor and or tax professional before implementing any strategy discussed herein. Past performance is not indicative of future performance.